Okay, uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Lorna Jane Mitchell. She's a developer advocate at Vonage and an open API community member. Uh, I've had a chance to talk with Lorna before and she's really fun to talk to, super knowledgeable about uh, the open API spec. And um, she's, she's a very enthusiastic, organized individual. She's got a, an engineering background in software. Um, as a developer advocate, Lorna listens to developers both online and in real life, and then works to improve their their experience, uh, whether by talking or by patching. And I've never heard it said quite like that, but I, I like that, talking or patching. Uh, she loves to write and is a published author. Um, she is also a very experienced and engaging technical conference speaker. Uh, Lorna is passionate about open source and helping developers to make even more awesome things than they did already. And she's happiest when her GitHub graph is green. So uh, thank you, Lorna. And uh, I'm gonna leave the stage now and leave it to you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was such a charming introduction. Um, I'm a little bit freaked out by the, uh, by the tech gremlins, but let's see if we can work our magic. Um, right. Choose a window, any window. Maybe not that one with the passwords. Maybe this one with the presentations. Awesome. And hopefully mine is the right way round because Chris seemed to know how to reverse his and I have no idea how that would work. <clears throat> okay, fantastic. So um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll say good afternoon. I think it's good afternoon for some of you, probably uh, morning for some others. Um, today, I want to share with you some insights about SDKs, how they relate to open API, and also how they relate to developer experience. Um, as Mark mentioned, I'm a developer advocate currently at Vonage, and I really think that open API has influenced every aspect of how we work with developers and how we improve that developer experience. I'm focused on the wrong window. There we go. <laughs> so what is Open API? I think most of you are familiar, but just in case anyone landed here without the context, I think it's valuable to do the recap. Open API is a machine readable way of describing your APIs. And if you imagine API documentation, it looks like that, except in YAML or JSON. Um, so very machine readable, very verbose often because it's very, very descriptive. Um, we have the different endpoints, the parameters, everything to send with the request, and then really detailed um, responses, everything that you can expect to get back. Um, I like to call it the standard formerly known as Swagger. So if your still mouth is still saying Swagger, Try and say open API. It's been open API um, for about five years. Now, I am not speaking specifically about open API today, but it is exciting times in the open API space because the 3.1 release is really imminent. If you want to hear more about that, you need to see my other talk at this event, which is tomorrow, um, a little bit earlier than this slot. Uh, where I'll be introducing all of the things you need to know about OpenAPI 3.1 and that release, which is coming really soon. Spoiler, it's got webhooks. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so why do we wanna describe our APIs? And specifically, why do we wanna do that for machines? I think it can be easy to fall into the trap of creating API descriptions, but then thinking of them as part of your internal process, something that makes maybe your documentation or your other integrations better. And that's true, and, and it does, but it's got even more value when you publish your API descriptions. You're giving a gift to developers. You're giving them, um, you're empowering them, you're enabling them. Um, to do things that you haven't thought of yet. You're handing them control to do everything you want to do. I think for many of us, we get into open API, first of all, to create really precise and maintainable, programmatically correct reference documentation. And certainly for me, documentation was my route into this. And I think it is for many people. 
there's a bunch of other things you can do with your open API specification that can make a really big difference. So for example, um, <clears throat> you can import your collections to Postman um, and then use that as the basis for what you for creating a collection and publishing your API in other ways that make it easy for developers to onboard and have a great experience. We use our open API um, descriptions quite a lot with the mock servers. Um, I just saw a bunch of stoplight stuff in um, Chris's presentation. We use Prism um, or the built in Prism implementation that's in Stoplight Studio. And those things are great and really, really valuable. But today I want to really zoom in on a particular aspect of open API. Um, and that is using it as the basis for generating code, clients, libraries, SDKs, call them what you will. You can generate a bunch of other things. You can generate documentation. Um, but today I am all about generating the SDKs. Okay. So why is an SDK? part of a delightful developer experience. Well, when you have give developers more that's specific in their tech stack than just read the API documentation and hand transcribe it all over to your use case, you're really smoothing that on ramp. You're really getting people involved much more easy. I think when we think of developer experience, we all know that documentation is non-negotiable, right? You don't, I mean, I think I'm on record as saying, if you're not going to write great API documentation, don't publish the API. It is worthless. And I kind of feel that way. Um, so docs are non-negotiable, but libraries are also an incredible enabler. They're not more important than docs. Please still do the docs first. Um, but, you know, I would say that the libraries enable us to to choose a criminal metaphor, aid and abet the things that developers are doing. Like you're, you're really facilitating them and letting them um, achieve their dreams. API, it's not just an API wrapper when you build an SDK, you're really making things easy. You're giving them the context in their tech stack and smoothing out the edges. I'm often asked um, how to generate code. Like what does that look like? And for this example, I've been using openapigenerator.tech. There are other code generator tools around. I haven't used very many because this one works pretty well. Um, so yeah, you can run it locally. There's a hosted version. They also do a Docker version, which is what I'm using here. And the reason for that is um, I, I, there's no pressure then on the dependencies on my local machine. So the Docker, the Docker container has everything I need <laughs> and it makes it, there's less for me to get wrong <laughs> when I come to use this tool. Now, all I'm doing here is running a local command, generating some code and passing in some arguments. So verify.yaml is the API that I want to generate code for. Uh, actually, it's the Vonage Verify API. It's our 2FA solution. You can confirm that someone owns a phone number or you can send a confirmation code to it. So a, a very a very common that 2FA pattern. Giving it a package name, uh, we support multiple APIs. So I'm generating lots of little buckets of code to include in my SDK. I'm using the Go generator this time, and then there's a path to write it out to. So it's kind of a one-liner. Um, this is, I want to tell you, oh, you just run this command and the code gets generated. <laughs> If only. Uh, this is typically the, the moment at which I realize I need to go fix the API description. <laughs> um, so sometimes it can be a little bit of a negotiation of pleasing the tools and tightening up the description uh, so that it's it's useful in all the contexts that we want to use it in. Um, there definitely are limitations as well. All of and one of have been particularly a hazard for us. Okay, generated code. Um, you end up with something that looks like this. So I've got, you can see there's some config, there's a client, I've got the API default, um, which is has the wrappers for all of the different API endpoints that this SDK will call. That's very valuable. It's, it's very good. Um, 
with operation names as method names and all the right parameters. That's very, very useful. What's even more useful is the model structures that you can see there. Now, this example is for Go, um, and I think it's this type of stuff is even more valuable for the strongly typed languages. It's valuable in all the languages. It's even more valuable in the strongly typed languages like Go um, that you get the models because you can't, um, I'm trying to be diplomatic, <clears throat> you can't just sling JSON around the place. Um, my background's in PHP. I like to sling JSON around the place. Go does not really work like that in common with a lot of the strongly typed languages. You'll find this in .NET and Java as well. It's You need to define the structures that the JSON is going to map onto and give some information about what the fields are called in each context and so on. So these generated models are an incredible time saver when you're doing, when you're creating a library like this one. What can I say about the code itself? Um, I'm going to say it's better than nothing, which is faint praise, isn't it? I use generated code quite a bit as the kind of the source of truth for the work that I do. But I'm not sure I would ever publish this as it is. Um, it isn't very good. There are a lot of sharp edges. It looks like a machine wrote it because it did. Um, this is, I don't know, it's not something to be proud of. Um, it does give you the HTTP handling out of the box, probably some simple validation and the IDE autocomplete to make things easier. But if you're publishing your open API description, developers can generate the libraries they need for the platforms they're working on. So you don't need to guess or maintain a bunch of generated things. But also, if they are at a level where they can generate this themselves, like your the open API becomes self help for them. If you can't support a library, then you can't really publish it. So I would not advocate the generated code. Um, so I think there is some debate on that. And I'd be interested to hear how everyone else feels about it. So it's not great. <laughs> but we can do better. If you created open API descriptions of your APIs in order to generate documentation, then you get all of this generated code, the core of your SDK for free. And we can take that as the basis and then make some really key additions to improve that developer experience. All right, in this picture, generated code over on the right hand side, I've got a computer generated code. It's by itself, it's isolated. Only the computer writes this bit. And then it is separated by a very spiky barrier from the handmade code, the user facing code. This is the interface I want to use when I come to integrate with these APIs in this tech stack, right? I call this the jam. <laughs> it's kind of sweet and it and it smooths over the uh, it smooths over the gaps. The computer generated code has value. I don't want to write the boring parts. I'm not as accurate as the machine on all those endpoints, the verbs, the data types, right? Da, 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 da. Do not ask me to do this. But I don't want to expose that to users. The other advantage of having the computer generated code completely separate is that you generate this once, you never modify it. If something changes, either this, let's say, a new endpoint in your API or maybe just the generator improved, you can regenerate it and not lose anything. I mean, again, that's probably a lie. You probably need to tweak things. Stuff happens. Um, but <laughs> that's that's the aim. That's the goal is to not tangle the two together to keep the generated code separate. In that jam layer, in the handmade user facing section, we can wrap the sharp edges. You saw the screenshot from VS Code. This is that code. This is what you would have to do in user land to use the generated code in this instance. It's not particularly readable and it's not particularly straightforward. And I'm only slightly sorry about the white space crimes I employed to get it all on this slide. But 
you can then improve that by wrapping the code. So for example, this is the user interface that we actually publish for the uh, SDK that I created. You create an auth object with a key and secret. You've got, a, you've got a, a client that needs an auth object, and then you make a request with some parameters. It's very usable. These additional helpers, these small details, I feel have great value in an API. I call them helpers, right? So doing things like just give me your key and secret and I will do the right thing means that the user doesn't have to think. Also, we have a mix of sometimes the key and secret are parameters and sometimes they're like basic auth as a header or this auth line always looks the same for the users and the legwork for which parameter goes where is done inside the library. And again, it's just about reducing that cognitive load. Anything that everyone who integrated with your API would need to do in code, right? All of those things that would be in every single application, put them in the SDK, add them as a helper. You can see there's an example here of JWT authentication. Some of our newer APIs work like this. You give an, an application ID for which application you're accessing, and then the private key that pairs with that application ID. Then I go ahead and I use that auth and I make the API call to those endpoints for those APIs for you. There are lots of reasons you might want to get a JWT and use it yourself, either make your own request or just get one to use with maybe your Postman collection. So I've always advocated adding these, um, I call them escape routes. So rather than just give the creds to me, I will do the JWT, I will make the API call, you may have the result. Instead, let people get their own JWT if they want it. You know, I have to create that inside the library. Why not expose it and let users get as involved or not as possible? Again, you're, you're empowering developers. You're giving them the ability to help themselves. Um, security helpers, uh, there's a couple of places in the Vonage APIs where you are receiving webhooks from the Vonage servers, but we're on the cloud, so IP whitelisting is not really a thing. Instead, we give you a shared secret. So you get it from your dashboard. The Vonage servers have it, you have it in your application. And when we send you data, we first of all use that signature to create we use that shared secret to create a signature with a hash, and then we send it through to you with the signature. We never transmit the shared secret, but you can reproduce that secret on your side. Now, I've written the documentation for this secret, um, for the signature generation, and I have implemented it in a couple of different languages, and it's tedious. It's not hard. It's just annoying. You have to get the for all the different parameters and then sort them get them in the order and then concatenate them and then use your shared secret and then do the hash. Like everybody who implements this needs to do that. So I include that in the SDK. Also, I'd have to talk about it again. Once it's in the SDK, everybody just does it that way. But even better, it's a one-liner and we include this one-line way to check this, this signature in all of our examples. So if you know why this is here and you were thinking I must check the signature of that incoming webhook, that would be good practice. You'll see this and you'll know that I've taken care of it for you. However, if you have no idea why this is here, hopefully you will still copy and paste it into your application and I can still protect you from any sort of terrible mishap um, because I've implemented this for you. So the easiest thing is the right thing. You pave the path of the behavior you want to see. Another type of helper that I build sometimes is, well, I'm calling it a builder here. And it's, in this instance, again, it's, it's about working with JSON from strongly typed languages, right? The way that the voice API works, we have these call control objects, you build this JSON structure and you can, you can use it in a couple of different contexts. Just building that thing in Go sends you into some kind of map, maze, chaos. <laughs> Just, I, I wasn't gonna build a builder uh, on the first attempt when I was building this, this API. 
this SDK. I, I, I really didn't want to go overboard. It's a new thing. I, you know, we can iterate. We can add bells and whistles later. I don't want to get carried away. It was so difficult for me to just test the functionality and build the first examples that I ended up building a builder, but in kind of in my user land. And so I patched it back into the SDK. Everybody needs this just as a feature of how the API is shaped and how this particular tech stack is shaped. So it's something that um, I think is really valuable and it avoids everyone who tries to use the SDK and it, all it is is a simple API wrapper. It avoids having everyone um, have to implement something similar or end up, yeah, just thinking too hard about the map stuff because that would be really frustrating. Or just pasting JSON strings would also be really frustrating. Um, yeah. So there's a bunch of things there. And I wanted to kind of reflect on what makes the SDKs delightful in the first place. I mean, the most important thing is that they are accurate and reliable. And I feel that using open API as a basis for the SDK, not just generating something and calling it an SDK, it isn't. Uh, it's like some kind of tech specific wrapper code. Um, but by generating the open a from the open API descriptions, which has every parameter, you know, spelled correctly, uh, correctly validated, <laughs> data types unknown, <laughs> all those, you know, small details. Um, we, by starting from that and kind of letting the machines do that heavy lifting of just busy, busy work of bringing that sort of representation into my tech stack, giving me wrappers for each of the endpoints that I might call, maybe handling the auth for me. That's really valuable. But the delight comes when you go and do the value add. When you design the user interface, you want the developer to have. You think about their context, the developer experience you're aiming for, right? When you make everything easy with really consistent, um, a really consistent SDK like developer experience, even though maybe your APIs are not that consistent behind the scenes, you add delight when you add helpers, especially helpers that make difficult things or just advanced concepts, the right thing becomes the easy thing because you've paved the way and it's there in the examples. I think the examples, I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? But the examples do a huge amount of the work in terms of showing people what they can do or how to do it. So um, there's an awful lot there that I think is really valuable. Um, better developer experiences gives you uh, happy developers. Hopefully they tell their friends as well. And open API for us has been absolutely at the core of that. Um, if you have questions, I have a few minutes. You should start typing now. <laughs> and I have some links to share. Um, I'll also be hanging about in the chat afterwards. So, um, you know, if I don't get it right now, I will get it in a minute. Um, first of all, I'm I want to share a link to the um, the SDK that we created that this talk is about. And if you check that out, it has its own GitHub Pages instance as well with all of those examples in on how to use it. Um, a link through to the Open API specification, of course. A link also to the uh, Vonage SDKs page. We're still rebranding. You might know us as Nexmo. I'm sorry. Um, OpenAPI.tools. Go and have a look at all the tools you can use with OpenAPI. Um, there are other code generators. And obviously, I know you've heard about a lot of tools today. And finally, me, my contact details, my blog. I still, it's not fashionable, I know, but I still blog um, and often about these things. So um, yeah, check me out at lordyjane.net as well. Hey, blogs are cool. I'm happy you're doing it. Uh, thank <laughs> you so much, Lorna Jane. Um, I would like to, uh, well, we, we're we about to run out of time, but uh, Ruby asked a question. Um, I'm not sure you have time to answer it um, out loud, but if you'll at least answer it in chat, that may be the best thing. But Ruby's, Ruby's question was, um, how do you maintain the SDKs when there are challenges in the API? 
For example, if there are new functionalities or deprecated parameters in an API version. And, Let me try uh, with one sentence. Um, okay. We regenerate the code from the updated API version. We regenerate the code, and then I just up, I just have that intermediate layer to update and some examples and stuff. So this structure that I showed you today is designed to be very maintainable. Awesome. Thank you so 